Hello, this is David Mandel. I'm back. And um, right now, what I want to talk about is related to Chapter 4, except um, specifically I want to go over some oh, review material, preliminary re material, or, or maybe it's actually material from a couple chapters, like Chapter 6, that on advanced installation. Uh, this is stuff that is usually covered very early in a class. Um, possibly I did cover it some in some of my earlier videos, but um, not um, um, but but not as well as I would like. Um, in the old days, we covered this stuff really thoroughly because you had to know this to do an installation period. But now with the new distributions like um, uh, well a Fedora or SUSE or 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 any of them, uh, this stuff is so straightforward that the, the distributions are so automatic that you can kind of skip through this and get through a successful um, installation. However, it's stuff that you do need to know and understand. We're going to cover some of this. We'll probably cover it pretty briefly because we'll cover it again when we talk about advanced installation. The first thing I want to talk about is swap space. What swap space is, is swap space um, in the old days, um, RAM was very, very expensive. It's still expensive, but it was very expensive. And buying a few megabytes of RAM could cost a lot of money. I remember paying, I think it was 30 some thousand dollars for um, eight megabytes of RAM. and. When I bought another eight megabytes, this was for a big machine that had maybe 100 users on it. I had eight megabytes of RAM. When I bought the next eight megabytes of RAM, it was probably $2,500 per megabyte. So that was a fair chunk of money. Uh, the entire machine was, you know, over $300,000. And um, um, and we had 16 megabytes of RAM, 100 users, um, and um, I believe we shared two 300 megabyte uh, removable, di removable disk drives. So that was in the 1980s. <coughs> OK. Um, so what was done is people created something called virtual memory. Because often your programs, especially scientific programs, would use huge, want to use huge amounts of memory, but you did not have the memory to be used. So they came up with a system where they could uh, basically set aside a chunk of disk and pretend that it was memory. And it would swap pages in and out of this, um, uh, from disk to RAM, from disk to RAM. Um, any time it needed it. And the operating system would do this automatically so programmers could write programs that used big arrays and didn't have to worry about um, the ins and outs of, um, of handling all that stuff themselves. And believe me, as an application programmer um, who used to write software to do something called Fourier analysis using big, long time series, that was wonderful. Now, the downside of using a lot of swap space, or at the time I grew up, we called it paging space. I still sometimes refer to it as paging space. Um, but Linux calls it swap space. Uh, the downside of that, is, of course, is that it is exceedingly slow compared with uh, RAM. Um, Sometimes the speed isn't a problem because it will sometimes page out a whole task that is, you know, just, it's like one of these stupid windows I have, you know. Um, this guy over here in the background um, uh, is using a lot of RAM, um, my Emacs session, but it's not doing anything, so it might as well be sitting out there on disk. and. Um, Modern operating systems are pretty good about knowing what's the, um, you know, what type, where memory is that's not being used, and it gets it out onto um, swap space where it can sit until you do want to do something with it. Okay, um, 
I guess there's commands for looking at swap space. Um, in a notice I am root in this window, um, I think there's a command called swap. There's swap. Well, there's basically there's two important commands. There's swap on and there's swap off. If I type swap, whoop, swap on space minus s, that will just tell me how much swap space I'm using. It says here that I'm using, you know, this is about two gigabytes of swap space um, off my disk, which isn't very much, but um, given how much RAM I have, but hey, that's OK. Um, how much RAM, how much swap space should you set aside? Uh, the books often say, you know, maybe two times the swap space that you have RAM. That's never made much sense to me. I don't think there is a hard and fast rule exactly. If I'm using a system for huge scientific programs, I'm going to set aside a lot of uh, space for swap space. And if I, if my machine doesn't have much RAM, I'll set aside huge amount of space for swap space because it's the only way I can run the software. If if I'm running uh, software, yes. Um, if I'm running software that wants to use lots and lots of space, I'll set aside a lot of space relative to the amount of RAM I have for swap space because um, um, because um, it's the only way the program is going to run. So yes, it will run slow, but that's better than not running at all. On the other hand, if I have a machine like this machine that has um, 6 gigabytes, 8 gigabytes of RAM, 6 gigabytes, I think. Um, in that case, um, and I'm not do I'm not using it for big scientific applications. Hey, that's all the that's lots of RAM, and so you know I don't need much swap space. So I just let this thing go to two gigabytes here. That was maybe I should have made six or eight gigabytes of RAM of uh, swap, but I don't know. I wouldn't be using it, so two gigabytes is enough. Um, I think we'll leave that at that. Um, there's also, there's command, well, the swap on command can allow you to have multiple swap partitions on multiple disk drives. You can set priorities on which swap spaces get used the most. And, uh, and, and of course, you can also use swap off to turn off a swap partition. So if you have a slow disk drive, maybe you want to just turn that one off. Um, Anyway, it lets you play with your swap space. Um, the other thing is we can partition on hard drives. The commands to partition hard drives, well, there's gparted, which will let you change the size of like an NTFS disk. If you've got a disk that is entirely in a Windows disk, you want to put Linux on it someplace. If you use gparted, which is actually a small Linux operating system, uh, I think it's Linux. I'm not sure. It's it's a system that boots up, and you you can do things with your partitions. Uh, boots from a CD-ROM, um, and you can resize your partitions without losing data. Um, I have not used Gparted hardly at all, so I won't say too much about it. The system that I tend, or uh, the other way to set aside partition space is fdisk. Fdisk will let you repartition your hard drive. Um, as an example, FDS, let's see, this hard drive is named um, SDB. I don't know what happened to SDA, but, uh, but apparently it's SDB. Let's see where SDA is. Oh, uh, SDA. Well, it's uh, um, M for help. I don't know what that, why it's M for help. Um, maybe the person was not, um, didn't speak English. I, I don't know. Anyway, else, uh, uh, P will print out my partition table. And what I find here is that all my partitions seem to be of the type NTFS or something like that. So actually, SDA, I think, is a Windows disk. Um, 
let's look at, and notice I'm very careful. I'm not going to write um, um, write to my disk, or I would destroy everything I've got on the system. Um, this gives me a list of the partitions on my um, uh, um, on my Linux hard drive, which is SDB. It says that I've got a type 82, which apparently is a swap partition, a Linux swap, or a Solaris. A Linux swap partition, I've got a couple um, Linux partitions here. I've got another Linux partition. Um, SD4 kind of. Oh, it's a Windows 95. I don't know why it says Windows 95, but it's an extended partition um, because I'm only allowed to have four primary partitions. So any partition after that is actually made inside of um, the extended partition, which is uh, slash dev slash sdb4. OK, let's go back to this here. So that's the story with FDisk, which you'll get to know better later. At least I hope you get to know that, because uh, it's really useful in doing, I call, call it non-standard installs, or adding a hard drive to your system. I don't like the GUIs for that myself. I'd rather use FDisk manually. And often I do that. I will partition my whole hard drive and get it ready manually before I start any install using automatic install software. Um, I just find that more um, easier and more comfortable. OK, so how much RAM, swap space, disk, CPU do you need for a system? Um, the books all talk about this, and they say, you know, they, they they give modest amounts, but but I would give minimal amounts. I think they're way too large on how much you actually need for a system. I have installed Linux on systems as small as um, a 386.16 running uh, 5 megabytes of RAM. Now, I will tell you that is, and I've installed X with X Windows, uh, bare bones X Windows, or Linux with X Windows, bare bones. Um, that is very, very difficult, that install. The truth is I couldn't get the install program to run, so I took the hard disk to another machine, a bigger machine with more RAM, and did the install there, and then took the disk back to my original Linux machine, and it booted and ran fine. Um, there were some tricks involved. but I am saying you can put Linux on very, very small machines. And that's really important because, yes, a desktop computer nowadays, we have lots of RAM, lots of, you know, they're big, they're huge. But Linux is also running on a lot of small machines. It's running on, well, I don't know about wristwatches, but it's running on little embedded machines that you put inside cars. A lot of your wireless access points, in spite of the problems of Linux, some of them run the Linux, or in spite of the problems of lack of support of the wireless cards for Linux. A lot of wireless access points, some of them run Linux, uh, routers, uh, firewalls, and, and a lot of um, things that you don't think of as running Linux run Linux. And it's important to, um, it, it's important to have those um, um, on as small a machine as possible because, you know, $5 of RAM, $5 of this, $10 of that. When you multiply it um, by a million, units, and um, it, it's a matter of being competitive or not being competitive. So it, it's it's significant. Anyway, I would not worry about, oops, I think I'm running out of time here. Let me um, r start part two of the video.